House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren and Mr. John Copenhaver. How are you doing? I am just splendid today, Al. You're just taking a soak in the tub? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm from the, sitting in the bathtub right now, you know, just kicking back and, um, you know, enjoying the uh, the bubbles. <laughs> yeah. Do you smoke a cigar when you're in the tub? I No. Ugh, I do not like cigars. <laughs> <you please. laughs> no, but it's a look, you know. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, so if you need that for the look, there you go. Yeah. That sounds you, don't, you don't have to really smoke it. You can just have it sitting in your mouth, right? Yeah, with my glass of champagne. You yeah. Know? yeah, trying to be rough, you know, and get, <laughs> show the tattoos. And no tattoos, but you can show them off. You can have them right, going on. Right. You know? I can always get those temporary tattoos you can remove, you know, just. You yeah, know. I used to do that as a kid, you know, but they were oh, yeah. like su- Superman and stuff like that. They weren't like like anything <laughs> nasty. Well, that's and, good. Yeah, you that's know. A and, good tattoo to have. Well, yeah, and that's why I'm as warped as I am. Yeah. You know, they, they let me do that. Well, you know, and of course, before we get into the guest today, I have to mention, of course, the bad news today. You've heard Tina Turner passed away. Yeah, I just heard. My husband just shouted down to me. And yes, very sad. Yeah. I, I I don't know why it's shocking, but it is. I, I, I guess because she had a stroke before and she's been ill a lot lately. So I guess that's, it shouldn't be. But I just, she seemed like a, a tough woman. So I didn't really, I, I kind of thought she lived to 100. Yeah, well, she just uh, sort of a constantly in the kind of public conscience i think you know it's just just one of those performers that doesn't kind of leave your mind and i think whenever one of those like prince or someone like that passes um other princes was you know even more tragic i just i felt like you know it, there's a real kind of sense of loss so i think it's yeah. good about that well at least she, she made 83 so um, yeah it's fun to celebrate that yeah she did get a pretty good life um not, you know, longer than Prince, for instance. But uh, anyway, anyway. Um, so on to something even happier. No, we've got um, a great guest here. Now, a Rattling Good Yarns has sent, um, uh, you know, a new book and an author. Now, the book is called At Sea with Patrick Dennis. And um, so for people... Patrick Dennis. I guess we, we'll we'll get into that with the with the guest and kind of get through who Patrick Dennis was. I think a lot of people might know, um, but let's get in the uh, guest. So Bernie Ardia, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Bernie. How did you get yourself into this um, madcap Mexican adventure? It was a mad <laughs> madcap adventure getting it to me. <laughs> Yeah. It really goes back almost 20 years of steps to have led up to me getting the manuscript on my desk. And it was just a series of people I met who introduced me to a next person, to a next person, and a next person. And it just drove me right to this path of of saving this book. It happened what we saw. Have you heard of Phil Ford and Mimi Hines? I haven't, but <laughs> I'm, I'm severely out okay. of touch. But... Well, they, they go way back in television and radio, and they were an, a neighbor of ours in Las Vegas 20 years ago when we moved there. For a, and uh, they introduced us to a woman named Ann McCormick. And Ann McCormick was a wonderful singer and had an incredible life. And she is the mother of actor Don Stroud. She is a singer who opened for Sinatra. And she had a crazy, she was married to Jackie Coogan and Paul Livermore of Wall Street. And she just has this family that every sibling is as incredible as she is. And there's only one left, but Lori McCormick, her sister, knew some friends out here in Rancho Mirage who she wanted us to meet when we moved here 10 years ago, Rob, the author of this memoir, and his partner, Jerry. And when we moved here, she gave us their phone number and wanted us to connect because Lori was in casting, and she loved to cast friends. She always felt she know, would know who liked who and who would get along at a dinner table. And she was insistent that we meet Rob and Jerry. And we tried. And when we would call 
uh, Jerry was not well, and Rob was taking care of him, so it was never the right time. But we could talk. We exchanged emails. In the end, it was Rob who passed away and not Jerry. Wasn't that the way? Yeah. You never know, right? You never know. It was some months later, it was in 2019, that Lori had a collection of papers and manuscripts and photographs and all kinds of things Rob would send her, because they were friends way back in the 60s, 70s, 80s in Hawaii. And so her plan now was to send me the box so we could take it and Jerry and finally meet Jerry. But when she, when I got it, I called her and I told her I got the box. And she says, well, don't give it right away. She says, look through it all because you're going to find some other things very interesting. And what really stood out was this big fat manuscript that says Patrick and I on the cover. So I had heard a bit about this adventure and from Lori and I had it sitting on my desk at least six months because I was working on something else and reading is a luxury I have a lot of time for unfortunately and um, we you know as I say in the book <laughs> I can be embarrassed now but every year we go to the Beverly Hills Hotel with the dog, and we write out our Christmas cards. And it was on that trip in 2019 that I threw that manuscript in my bag, and we went off, and I had time to read it. And I really just started it, and I called Lori, and I said, Lori, this is amazing. I said, I'm really loving this. And she says, well, I told you it was good. Yeah. I said, well, I know you told me it was good, but now I'm reading it, and I can see how good it is, and I – and I'm loving it. And I said, but what's going, what's going to happen to this? And when I said that, I had no intention of doing what I've done. It was just that I felt it was important because it was about Patrick Dennis, who brought us Auntie Mame, who I love. And, you know, it's gay history. Yet it was, it's just this tale that is completely Auntie Mame like. And it's real life. And, I was just loving it, and I just asked. And she goes, well, I don't know what's going to happen to it. I'll ask Jerry. And I said, well, let me know if the family is going to try and publish this or, or, or if it's going to be a play or what, what is going to happen. Because I had no idea what Rob had published or not published or what he was working on. We never got that conversation going into friendship. It was always about Hawaii and the McCormick sisters or here in Rancho Mirage. So she called me the next day and uh, said, no, there's no plans for it. And I, I was kind of sad. And I said, well, do you think I could get the rights somehow for it? I said, because it can't just disappear. And she said, well, let me find out. She loved doing these things. And she called Jerry. And I was told to, you know, write a letter to Jerry. And I did. And then I... I called him, and, and we talked, and it wasn't long after that that it was mine. And now I felt like I just adopted a child that I have to send to college. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know when, you get, when you read something and you, and you got it, you think, oh, it's great, it's, it's ready to go. Well, it wasn't ready to go, but it was almost ready. And so it was a year project for me, and then... We got Ian involved, and, and he he loved it like I loved it, and that was very important to me. Ian is the publisher, Rattling Good Yarns Press, and that was the spark to me that he got it. He he saw the same importance, the same humor that I saw, and so that was a match. Yeah, and R Rattling Good Yarns has been really um, putting a lot of effort into bringing out a lot of gay history in their publishing, so it fits totally. Now, Patrick Dennis, um, now that's not his real name, right? No. His real name was Ed Edward Everett Tanner? The third. The third. Ooh, so there were two <laughs> others before him. So now, and of course, as Patrick Dennis, that was his um, pseudonym, I guess. Yes. Um, he wrote, uh, of course, his Auntie Mame. I was just bringing this out just to let people know. So he was actually married to a woman, but yet oh, yeah. he was bisexual and he um, lived quite the... Um, he never divorced. Right. 
how did he live in a do – do you know anything, like, about that, like how you could be married and kids? I mean, I can see it nowadays, but back in the 60s and 70s, I mean, it was still illegal. Yes, he would be sexually fluid now. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know as – this is the one thing I love, a side love I have of this project is that it's not just bringing Rob's book out to the light. It's bringing Patrick back because – He's not well known anymore. He's known as the character of, of in anti mame and there just isn't much about him out there. And I think people should know who he is. And and I hope that when they read this, they want to read more of Patrick's writings. And Patrick was nicknamed, or Edward was nicknamed uh, Patrick by his father, uh, who named nicknamed him Pat after a boxer. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> of all things. <laughs> and he was in the Army. He was in the American Field Service. He joined in 1942. And in December of 48, he married Louise, and they had two children. But the whole time, he led a double life. And he was in New York and a Greenwich Village and all of that, and, and writing. Well, did, did he have a, a regular male partner back then, or was he just kind of fluid in that too i do not know that i do not know from just the adventure in mexico through rob i don't know that he was the type of person to stick around anywhere too long at all he seemed to bop around and you know just got i mean even i mean his books are all over the map and they're any he uses different names as an author and that's a good question i i wish i had that answer but i have not heard of anybody who was that partner in other than louise for a length of time yeah i find i find it really interesting especially in that time you know that era because things were so much different it's a wonderful question and if i'm ever around someone who might know that answer i'm going to ask you do that. <laughs> you, you, you let us know. Yeah. So now the book, the book is it was centered on, um, I guess the uh, the adventure in Mexico. I guess is what we're saying. So give, give us a little rundown of what people will get out of the book when they read it. Well, even if even if you don't know anything about Patrick Dennis, the story is so wonderful. It's so well written and character driven and. It's so visual that, you know, yes, it's odd because it, it's, to me, it's, it's a piece of gay history because of the characters, the three main characters in the book are gay. But it isn't about being gay. It's just about people and friendships and adventure. And that's, it's, it's very unusual that way. And it, it reads very much like an anti-main adventure. So I do think people are going to love the story. But what they will get, uh, you know, it's just these two guys, these two friends are going to Mexico on a cruise ship and they meet characters that only real life can bring. There's a woman with her grandchild and the captain and, and of course, Patrick, who they don't know who Patrick is quite yet because Patrick is pulling the wool over all kinds of people's eyes and really hasn't a cent. He got the ticket by borrowing money and he is, his plan is to bail and stay in Mexico a while. That was his intent. And these guys come to know him and, and he, Patrick is using people at left and right and, but it's all comical. And again, as I, as I find myself saying a lot, and having been in show business for 40 years with being parts of shows, you can't make real life up. You know, if you tell the truth about something, people will say, oh, I don't believe you. <laughs> but if you write it in a fictional form, they, they buy it. But these, this is nonfiction and these are real people and they're wonderful characters. Rob has captured the best of them. And it's very interesting because it's a real life of Patrick, and we all know where he ended it, being a butler for the Kroc family of McDonald's, and they did not know who he was. So this story is towards the end of this 
period of him being a writer and going into being a butler. And it's his last stab in Mexico. He's borrowing money from the publisher. He's borrowing money from anybody who's got money in their pocket. And he's surviving. And these three just go on this wild ride all over Mexico. And it's things that really happen, places that people will recognize. And I haven't been to the places, but it's so visual. I could I could feel the grit in his story. And yet there are wonderful times on ship when the, the Mrs. Winton, who is rich and wealthy, and the one thing you learn about Patrick is he's a chameleon. He's had money and he's had no money, and he can fit into any scenario that he's dropped into, and he can hold court anywhere and entertain, and this book entertains. What do you think... Um... And this may be sort of an odd question because obviously it's, it sounds like an amazing story. Um, but why do you think Rob decided to put it down? Like, what was his motivation for you know deciding that this was this you know th- this is what he was going to write? I think that it was a story of friendship. I think that he felt a love of ne- of having the adventure. He wrote this sometime after, and. I think that he missed his friend Patrick. I think he didn't realize the things he was learning from Patrick when he was with Patrick. I think it was all frustration then, but it turned into more because Rob, too, loved writing. And I think it was kind of a valentine to Patrick Dennis, in a sense, and for that his friend Walter. And he wanted to preserve it. And I also think that Rob, in some way, Envied the the writer that was Patrick Dennis, and I think he kind of realized that Patrick Dennis actually is anti Mame, and and Walter he was facing losing his job, so he was he was game to go anywhere. So the three of them, I think, all envied or or admired something about the other person that they were with of these three, and. Patrick was the Pied Piper, and they went along. I'm surprised they didn't all jump off from a cliff, because he did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, because there's a lot, you know, when you think about um, gay history, and, you know, we have a lot of, uh, historically, a lot of coming out stories, and that kind of thing. Yes. There's not tons of stories about gay friendship, and it seems like, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, like, those stories are really important, and that sounds like, do you agree that's sort of what this is? Absolutely. Thank you for putting it that way, because absolutely, this is about friendship. It has art. And we, and you know, I agree with you. There's a lot of those other stories. But this is, and it's strictly about stories, about uh, friendship, because these aren't lovers. These are friends. And we all have those friends that have gotten us through good times and bad times. And, you know, they are just our gay friends. And these are three gay men who are friends. And perhaps at one time, Rob and Walter had something. But at the time of this story, they are friends later and going on a a cruise, simply going on a vacation. And um, Rob and Walter are very much like Felix and the odd couple. I mean, just, these two are just night and day and hilarious on their own and then throw Patrick in. But it's friendship. And I, and I've said that it's, it's, it's a Valentine of, of a friend. Rob, I, uh, in Rob's intro uh, in, from the manuscript, which I did include in the book, it's it, having known Patrick was a gift to him. And I'm so happy that it is now out because this gift to Patrick was just in a box, and it probably would always be in a box. And I, another thing is that, you know, how many people, I think James told, said to me, you know, he has a fear of one day being gone, and he'll have this box of things that nobody's going to know what they are, and they're going to get thrown out. I mean, there are wonderful stories and boxes of of writers who are gone, and if anybody out there treasures one of those things, work on it. Get it life. It can be done. They, you know, it just happened that this happened to me, but it shows me that 
an author can publish something well after they're gone. Yeah, and that it might be incredibly important to have these stories yes. out there. Yes. You know, too often you do hear similar stories about uh, manuscripts or personal, you know, letters that really describe a life, um, and they're in someone's attic, and, so, and you know, in, in our case, you know, a lot of gay history has been, it was not kept, so it's a real find <laughs> to find something preserved. Yes, it is, it is, it is, and, you know, to me, Patrick's, you know, wonderful gift to all of us in the gay community and elsewhere is Auntie Mame herself. That character, you know, she's so strong. She's resilient. And she's hopeful. She's a survivor. You no, know, I, I was just reminded to today, Tina passed. And, you know, I felt very much she was all those things, too. And you don't expect those people to not win a battle. Well, what do you hope that, uh, or what do you think people will get out of this book? I hope they're entertained, number one. I hope, too, that they re- then get through this book. I mean, I, I think the gay community is, you know, they're, they're familiar with Patrick Dennis. I hope they are. I wish there was more gay education in schools, but that's not going to happen anytime this week. Um, but <laughs> people need to know who Patrick Dennis is. And they also, you know, I think that for non-gay people, I do think this is a crossover book because I think there are going to be people who get through this book and hardly realize who's gay, who isn't, or or it doesn't even matter. And I think there's a beauty to that as well. Kind of neutralizes everyone. And I think that the story comes through. The comic of of the the story is so crazy. And it's got biting wit. And I find the wit in it very sophisticated and sharp. I find it very much like the script of All About Eve. I mean, it's very snappy and very to the point and and honest. And I think honesty always works, and there's a lot of honesty in this in this work. I think they're just going to be entertained in the end. And they're going to, and in the end, they're going to go, oh, Patrick Dennis. And maybe they'll pick up another Patrick Dennis book. And learn more about him, because I think people need to pay attention to who he is before he's forgotten. How's doing this book changed you? How has this whole process um, worked on someone like you? <laughs> In a chunk of my life, as well as COVID did. See, that's a, it was, I believe this was meant to happen for me, because I was working on something completely different. I was working on another book entirely, and I was well into it, and... I had decided that it was time after 40-something years to stop designing hair and for shows, and uh, I did a tour of the Bronx Tale. And at the end of that run, I said I was done. And I came home, and I, and I got my desk cleared and all ready for a project, and COVID hit. And that, it was that Christmas that I drew the manuscript in my bag and started reading it and everything else is on hold <laughs> except i've been working on hairspray touring around the country popping over there but um i haven't gotten back to my other projects yet i i feel very strongly that i want to give this not just getting it into people's hands but i i want to give it a chance to be heard and seen so i'm doing all, anything i can to to promote this this piece because it's it's not easy. There's a lot of noise out there in the world and it's hard to get get heard and to get a book seen. And I feel I owe it. I I can't stop just at what I did. I feel a great accomplishment that it's actually a book now. And and Rob and Lori and all of them are up there hopefully dancing with champagne over it all. But I can't be done yet. I can't just say, okay, this is the end. I, I owe it to keep keep pushing a while. Then I'll get back. And I'll know when it's time to get back to my other book. <laughs> well, I'm fascinated by just the comparison of the author to his character, Auntie Mame, which I think most people are going to know. If they don't know the author, they're going to know Auntie Mame. Well, I don't know about young <laughs> young queer people, but um, they do need some education in gay history. I teach them, so I can say that. Um, but I agree. Yeah, I think so. Um, but you know, it, Auntie Mae is beyond that. I mean, I, my mom 
w- would tell you she's one of her favorite characters as well. For all the things that you cited, perseverance and hopefulness and those sorts of things. And, you know, um, do you think that, do you think as, you know, thinking about, I know it's nonfiction, but thinking about him as a sort of character, do you think he is, in fact, do you think there's some impact in Rob's writing and in, in, in casting Patrick as a kind of Auntie May? Or do you think this is just a- absolutely who Patrick was? I think it's, I think it's absolutely who Patrick was. <laughs> but I do, but I do think that in Rob's writing, in the memoir, that he captured it in a very anti-Mame tale. But I think Patrick was, I mean, I, I can see anti-Mame being down there in the ditches or, or, you know, on Park Avenue, and I can see Patrick the same way. He just was that, he lived in a, in a wild abandon. And, you know, I think dreamers do that. And he was, he's all those things anti-Mame was too. It's just a survivor and, you know, but hilarious and saw life through kind of a carefree sort of way and adapted to whatever came his way. It was rare that he was, you know, he, I guess he was desperate the whole time, but he didn't, he didn't live like he was desperate. He lived for the next cocktail. He lived for, for, for what time the bar and the hotel opened and, you know. We've all been there. <laughs> I'm still there. Anybody who's creative will understand that. <laughs> so you pleased with the way it turned out? I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. I wish there were more pictures. I wish there were more documentation of the three of them in Mexico. But the last thing they had was a camera. I mean, it was bad enough to hang on to Patrick's borrowed typewriter until it fell apart or got hawked or wherever it ended up behind locked doors because of unpaid bills. But it's so visual that it almost doesn't matter. I almost, I, when I first was talking to Ian about doing this, I almost wanted it illustrated because it is so visual. And I, you know, I could see these wonderful little caricatures of, of the three of them or, or one of them or some of these other characters in the book. It would just make really wonderful, whimsy drawings, but that would have taken another year or more, so we all have to live. <laughs> but it's so visual, everybody can think of, see their own pictures. I've been asked by several people when this is going to be a musical. <laughs> well, I was about to say, but you mentioned that early in the interview, something that you thought, well, was this, could this be a play, or do you... Yeah, I, I did. I, because it was so visual. I mean, I saw these, I saw the ship. I saw Mrs. Winton. I saw the grandchild. I saw them running. I saw, I could smell the dead fish. I could, I, I had been to the, the restaurant in Sausalito that they all go to. So I knew that area and you just, it's so he he's so descriptive in his in his writing. It's a joy. I mean, it's, he it's all there. It's all there. He lays it all out. Anything you want to know about these people is there at their core, and it's honest. And I always believe that any anything that works honest, because an audience knows when you're messing with them. And I always use that word. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so. And to me, it was honest, and that's what I'm attracted to. I'm attracted to real life. I'm attracted to people who live with no abandon. I mean, I just, I, I kind of raised myself that way. I mean, I just never, I didn't like limits. I don't like the word no. And I just think that those things that we all love, which can be a different thing for everybody, isn't there for somebody else. It can be yours too. What's interesting about a lot of you know, that idea of living with abandon is um, you know, not exclusively a queer or gay kind of idea, but it does feel a lot of those characters, either gay men or, or kind of identify with, or um, I know it's interesting to think about what attracts us, why Mame, you know, why Patrick, you know, are such attractive characters, Um into a general audience, but also to a gay audience. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, no. I mean, I maybe we feel we're different 
right from the get go. So we are, I don't know, or I don't know if for me, it was kind of a, a freedom to be gay. I always enjoyed it. Um, I've never been one to care about what people think. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have that answer. I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Um, but. Yeah, I'm not sure either. <laughs> no, I'm not sure either. But I, in the start of my book, I, I, before I knew who Auntie Mame was, I was going into LA with my, with my grandmother, who was a hairdresser, an award-winning hairdresser. And she would, we would go on Mondays. And on Mondays, the salons were all shut. They were all closed. And we, she knew where all the top people, and like Jean Chacob, and there are so many other names back then. But we would go on Mondays, and I would tag along. And we would, she would go to all the salons that were closed and peer in. We would all stand there and peer in the window to see what was the latest and greatest of salon decor. And, of course, in Beverly Hills, it was marble and mirrors and chandeliers and all of that. And I would look in these closed buildings, and it was like another world through that glass, and I loved it. And I just, I think that kind of shaped me, you know, to be attracted to Auntie Mame later on. So, you know, I don't know. I never felt it. It was I felt the freedom to like all those things. I think it's fine. And, and I don't I don't know why every you know, people are attracted to this or that. But I, I kind of think Auntie Mame is so universal, like your mother loved her. Right. I, I just think she she says it's okay to be, have wild abandon. She says it is, you know. She's she's dragging young Patrick off to the speakeasy and, you know, all those kinds of things. And it's okay. Yeah. She makes it okay. And has a cocktail for lunch or, lunch <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I do. Yeah, certainly a freedom, hey, that uh, take away the guilt. You know, everyone has that guilt, and then it's kind of... Yeah, life's too short. Life's too short yeah, to have and that I think that, I think that's what it represents. Was there, was there any surprises in the memoir? So when you were going through it, or was, was there anything that happened in there or any stories that you kind of... Oh, they are all a surprise. I mean, <laughs> honest to God, I was three quarters through this, manuscript and I was like I do not want this to end because it was it was I kind of liken it to to the series like uh, White Lotus it's like you never know what is going to be in this next episode this next chapter who are they going to encounter and these things are real and you're like oh my god like, okay let's go you know, it's just so wacky, and and you love them all. I don't know that, I guess, the real surprise is, you know, well, as as you go along, you're surprised, but as you as you keep reading, it's like, okay, now he's going to do this, and it's not going to surprise me, because look what he just did in the last city. And But to know how he came back to the States and then became a butler for the Crocs, and they didn't even know who he was, It's I find it a little bit sad that there wasn't another big book for him. There wasn't another big hit. I do think Patrick was searching for that. But I think his wild abandon <laughs> was getting to him just a little too much. And he wasn't disciplined. And I think that to get something made, there has to be the right balance of discipline and artistic ability and wild abandon. I think it's um, it's a things. Good art is a big happy accident. Sounds like John. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree with your analysis of what makes good art. <laughs> yeah, it yes. is. It's like this. It is truly this con- weird, this sort of mixture of things that. Um, some of which can be cultivated and some of which just are, you know. Just are, yes, because we all go into things with the best of intentions. I've been at so many shows where everybody is the first day, it's like, yes. And then it's like, yeah. And then it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so many outside factors can bless a project. And I, this one has, for me, and it's why I'm so dedicated to it still, has been blessed all the way along the way, from Lori, who sent it to me, to Jerry, who allowed me to get this far with it, to Ian coming into the picture, to it happening, and to COVID even. 
it gave me the blessing of those couple of years with, without with nobody working, which allowed me for my phone to stop ringing and I could concentrate on this and immerse myself in this. And so it was all blessed. I really believe this book was supposed to happen. Well, there you go. Now, um, the book is available everywhere, and you do social media. Do you have a website? Where do people come find it? I just uh, – <laughs> I have never been one for social media, but I now have an Instagram page for at C with Patrick Dennis, and it's all one word. Yeah, and I love people to send me their, a picture of them with their book or them unwrapping it or, or where they're at while they're reading it. I love that. I've been getting them. Even if they're in the bathtub having a, smoking a cigar. With a, with, a, with a plastic cigar prop. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's some hand in for you, right? And they make something that smoke come out. <laughs> well, we'll have that up on the website as well as the book and Rattling Good Yarns Publishing. That's going to be all there so people can find it easily with one click. And it's been a pleasure having you here. Now, the book, of course, is called At Sea with Patrick Dennis, My Madcap Mexican Adventure with the author of Anti May. We wanted to keep it short. Yeah, I was going to say, could it be any shorter? No, it's <laughs> wonderful. Um, so now the uh, author or the guy that put it together is Bernie Ardia. So thank you for being here. You're welcome, and thank you. It's been a pleasure meeting both of you. Thank you so much, Bernie. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.